You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney prior to or during any question. If you can't afford one, the court will appoint one for you. Do you understand your rights? When the wolf is at your door, you run in zone, but that's for sure. Everybody and welcome to this episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. And as always, I'm your host, Woody Overton. And today, thanks to all our supporters and lifers and convicts and Patreon members who are subscribers, I'm going to be starting Season 10 of Real Life, Real Crime. And today, the story I'm going to begin to tell, it's a hard one to hear And as always, my heart goes out to the victim's family members, um, parents, siblings, children, whoever you may be, friends, loved ones, and even to a certain extent, to some of the bad guys, family members, they're going to have to relive this again after all these years. But I'm going to name the name of this episode, I Did It. Stay tuned at the end of the episode for some real life, real crime announcements. So, y'all, on this story, the the story is almost like an urban legend, if you will, and that's hard to say. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it's hard for the family to hear, but the story has been around forever, and it really begins on October 27th of 1997. And instead of just telling you about another murder and how the case was worked, et cetera, on this one, I really, really want to do right by the family, the victim's family, and I want to tell who the victim was, okay? And his name was Shane Dennis Abair, and he was born on December the 3rd, 1977. And he was born and raised in Livingston Parish, very loving family. Let me back up for a second. On on this case, because I've been thinking about it for so long and I wanted to do it right, um, I don't want this victim to be just a shame, to be just another statistic. I debated on whether or not to reach out to his mama, um, who was still alive, and talk to her about the story ahead of time. I didn't even know she would talk to me. But I did reach out to her, and I'm glad I did. And she got to tell me a lot, a lot of things about Shane, who he was as a person, how he lived his life and everything. So I I hope that I can convey this correctly. But, you know, we become so desensitized to murder, all the true crime shows and everything else. And I think that a lot of times we forget about you hear about the victims, but you forget that they were real, live, breathing people who have loved ones who love them dearly. So, Shane, I'll go back to it, was born and raised in Livingston Parish. And by all accounts, everybody loved him. And he just was a character, they said. Uh, always had a smile on his face. Always making people laugh like his mama said sometimes Shane would just do something so outrageous or funny or whatever and she would look at him and say you know where where'd you get that from and that uh you know she said he loved to make people laugh and sometimes she she got exasperated by his antics if you will 
and she'd say, she would look at him and ask, where did you come from? And Shane would point at her and smile and say, I came from you, mama, right? And she had to laugh about it. But he said he had a lot of friends and never met a stranger. Y'all, he loved to hunt and fish like I do. He loved his friends and, and loved hanging out with his friends. Uh, he was growing up. Um, he was a young man, and he was married, and he had two babies. Um, they were five months old. He had twins. And they said he would carry his twins around under his arm, and he called one of them football and one of them six pack because he came around on his arms right and that he was he was a great daddy he was a new daddy but he was a great daddy um his mama said one day she walked into his house and he was vacuuming the, the floor and he was holding one baby and using the vacuum to push the other one around in the walker <laughs> and and he told his mama hey look i got this you know and she said even though he was young he was turning out to be a wonderful dad so he was also a big brother, and they said he was a great big brother, and, and his sisters loved him, and they called him Bubba, and he enjoyed doing things with them and aggravating them, right? That's what older brothers are for. And, hey, his favorite color was green, and he loved Ford trucks. A couple days before Shane was murdered, his mama said that there was another murder, and it was of a, of a juvenile, y'all. I remember this case. And she she asked Shane about it, and she said, "Baby, did you know this this boy who got murdered?" And he said, "No, Mama, I didn't." He said, "But things are crazy now, right?" He said, "People even shoot you up here in Watson for no reason." A couple of days later, his words would prove to be true. But on the on that day, October twenty seventh, nineteen ninety seven. He went through his daily routine, and he lived a they like lived on a like I would call a compound. It was the grandmother's home, the mama's home, and then Shane's trailer was there also. But he goes over to eat, and grandmother had cooked, and she cooked pork chops, and which were his favorite. But his mama's pork chops were his favorite. But she also cooked cabbage, and his grandmother's cabbage was his favorite, right? So he, they said he's, he's a big guy, big boy too, right? And he's eating. And they said he got done eating. And grandmother asked him, said, Shane, um, my pork chop's better than your mama's? And he said he sat back and he thought for a second. And he said, no, Grandma, my mama's pork chops are still better than yours. But I promise you this, your cabbage is better than hers, right? And then a few minutes later, he left. And he went to his, his residence. When he was in his residence, his wife asked him to go to the store to get some milk or something. I don't remember what she said it was, but the asked him to go to the store, and so he did. He left. He goes to the store, and while he's at the store, one of his friends sees him. Now, his, his friend's name was Murray Broussard. And Murray Broussard was born in May the 27th of 1976. And he drove a white 1992 Toyota Corolla. But he sees Shane at the store and approaches him and says, Hey, you know what? Um, can you take a ride with me to the Watson ballpark? He said, I got a deal I got to make. And Shane was like, mm, You know what? We can do it, but it's got to be quick because I got to get home. Uh, I'm starting school again tomorrow. So Shane gets in the passenger seat of the Corolla, and they go up Highway 16, y'all, and that runs north and south through Livingston Parish. And they're up in Watson. Now, back then, Watson wasn't as commercialized and grown up as it is now. I mean, it was almost nothing. There was no Walmart, no Walgreens, no you know, maybe one fast food place or whatever, but as you go north uh, out of what they call the, the town of Watson, it's not really a town, uh, the, the there was a ballpark 
Live Oak Ballpark on the left-hand side, but it's north of everything, y'all. It kind of gets dark a little bit. There may have been some residences, but no more businesses. And if you're going north on 16, the ballpark is on your left. And they turn into the ballpark, and they see at least one vehicle. And standing outside the vehicle was Matthew J. Street. And another guy that Murray didn't know his last name. He just knew him by Avery, A-V-E-R-Y. Later on, it would be proven to be Avery Lejeune. Hey, y'all. You've heard me talk about Just Thrive before, but let me tell you about it again. If you want to hear something that's truly gruesome, 9 out of 10 Americans suffer from some type of gut issue. Gas, bloating, diarrhea, acid reflux. And it's so common, people think it's a normal part of their life. But 80% of your immune system lives in your gut, meaning an unhealthy gut equals weak immunity. Probiotics are supposed to be the best way to support the gut. However, research shows 99.9% of the probiotics die in your naturally harsh stomach acid before they get where they're needed. This is what makes Just Thrive probiotics so revolutionary. Proprietary formula is designed by nature to protect itself when conditions get rough. Studies have proven that Just Thrive probiotic arrives 100% alive in your gut, making them uniquely effective for gas, constipation, and bloating, and providing much-needed immune support. It's vegan-friendly, gluten-free, dairy-free, histamine-free, and non-GMO. Safe for just about any age, including moms-to-be. Endorsed by some of the biggest health luminaries on the planet, to give your body the crucial immune and digestive support and feel your best, there's nothing like the award-winning Just Thrive Probiotic. Y'all, I've been taking it now for about a month and a half, and it really helps with indigestion and, and just makes me feel better overall. So there's nothing like the award-winning Just Thrive Probiotic. Get 15% off. Go to Just Thrive Health dot com and use code R L R C at checkout. Let's go to just thrive health dot com and use code R L R C at checkout to get 15% off. At the same time, they're pulling in the the he sees the vehicle that Avery and Matthew Street are in. It's a maroon color vehicle and it has a like a real dented hood and the hood is tied down to the bumper with a piece of rope. Murray says that Avery walks up to his window and starts talking to him through the window. Now I'm going to tell you some more of the story. Around the same time, Deputy Billy Amy, who, you know, I think his, his unit number was like 328, and he was in uniform patrol, had been uh, for a little while, but he was going north on Highway 16 and about to pass the ballpark. Now, this ballpark was really dark back then. You look at it now. It's all lit up. It has a running track and all this stuff. It wasn't like that back then, y'all. And, and that probably until the mid 2000s uh, when they changed that. But it was a known spot for narcotics transactions to go down between the people in Livingston Parish because it's just north enough where really nobody went up there at nighttime. But Billy was patrolling in his marked unit in. He's passing the ballpark, and he told me, he said, Woody, I looked over, and I saw at least three vehicles parked in the back. And he said, I already knew. 
I'll believe it was going to be a dope transaction. He said, so I, he said, I, I didn't hit my brakes because I didn't want them to see that I was in a, a marked unit. Now, y'all back then, the only p- people that were driving Crown Vicks, and that's what Billy was in, were the cops. And yes, if you hit the brakes and you happen to be looking up from a dark spot on the side of the road and the cop hits the brakes, you can see that it's a Crown Vic and you can see the lights on the top of the car. Well, Billy was no rookie hand, if you will. He, he knew if he hit his brake lights, he wouldn't be able to turn around and pull them in on them and bust them on a drug deal if, that, if that's what was going down. So he said he let off the gas without hitting his brakes and was getting ready to t- turn around and go back to the ballpark and pull in on them. They wouldn't have had anywhere to go, right? But at the same time, here's 259-328. That's his number. So he has to answer the radio. So he answers 328, go ahead. They said we need to get dispatched to a 62A panic alarm on Thunderbird Beach Road. Now, y'all, 62A is a burglar alarm, and we used to get them all the time, especially like in the evening time when people were getting home or kids were getting home from school and they didn't have the code or, or whatever it may be. But this one was a little bit different, and it, you didn't. it wasn't often that you got a 62A most of 62As or the, or the house alarms that would go out were, were fake for one reason or another. It was just an accident or, you know, the cat ran in front of the motion sensor or whatever it may be. And it was really almost a problem for us because you were always running down these bullshit alarm calls. You know, you get there and there's nothing to it. But this one, somebody had to hit the panic button. So Billy's thinking, ah, oh, shit, you know, you got to get there. And and meanwhile, dispatch had tried to call the people back, and they got no answer. So Billy turns around, and he's driving back, and he said right when he got to the entrance to the ballpark, this white Toyota comes slamming up on the road and punches it right in front of him, punches it, heading now south on 16, back from the direction that Billy had originally come from. And Billy's like, what the hell? And he said the guy punched it, and he was like, man, i got to go to, to this panic alarm, but he's, I'm going this direction anyway. So he's kind of following, trying to punch it, almost trying to keep up, up to him. And when he got down the road, right before he had to make his turn, the, the white Toyota turns off into what at that time was like a little convenience store, Live Oak something or another, and y'all – that's like in the Watson area, they have a Live Oak High School. Everything is Live Oak up there. But it, that store is no longer there. That's where the Walgreens is today. But he said that car whips into the into the, um, that sh- little gas station, if you will. And he was like, well, I, I got to go catch this call, right? The, the radio called back and said, we still can't get them on the line, panic alarm waiting on you. So where he was going wasn't that far away. And this is right, right around... Uh, when he passed the ballpark, it was right around 8.50, something like that. He gets the call to be dispatched to the 62A panic alarm right before 9 o'clock, turns around. Then the white Toyota pulls out in front of him, and they pull into that gas station, and he's got to get to, to the panic alarm. So he gets to the panic alarm, pulls out, it gets out of his vehicle, and the homeowners come outside. And they were like, hey, 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 it was an accident. It was an accident, and we couldn't get to the phone. And he was, like, trying to talk to him for a second, making sure there was no foul play. And But they were adamant. They were like, I'm so sorry. You know, the wife said it hit the panic alarm, and I couldn't get to the phone in time. I, I know the dispatcher was trying to call us, et cetera. When Billy, at the same time, dispatch comes out and says, all units, we have a reporting of a double shooting and the victims are at that gas station in Watson. I, I think it was Live Oak something, y'all. I can't remember the name. But the uh, Billy's like, what? And then they gave a description of the car that was at the thing. Billy was like, that's a car that just pulled out in front of me, right? So he, he went 10-8. And he said he's in route. 10-8, he, he told the people, bye. He calls in the radio, and he says, 328's in route. I'm right around the corner. When it comes to personal hygiene, who has time to read that long list of ingredients on the back of the bottle? Some ingredients I can't even pronounce. 
If you're like me and you care about what goes on your body, then it's time to try native personal care products like I did. Every native product is thoughtfully formulated to keep you feeling and smelling fresh all day long. Best known for their aluminum-free deodorant, Native wants to help you practice safe sweats, which is why they keep their ingredients list bare naked with ingredients you understand like coconut oil, shea butter, and baking soda. Native deodorant checks a lot of boxes. 24-hour odor protection, naturally derived ingredients, a smooth residue-free application, and over 10 cents to choose from. Native's coconut and vanilla scented deodorant has been a fan favorite for years. And other scents include lavender and rose, cucumber and mint, or even unscented. Recently, Native has partnered with Baked by Melissa with a collection of scents inspired by Baked by Melissa's delicious cupcake creations. From tie-dye vanilla cupcake, mint chocolate cupcake, fresh peach cupcake, to ginger lemonade cupcake, they are sure to make your day a little sweeter. Now is the time to make the switch from antiperspirant to native. When you visit their site, you can discover all the fresh scents and maybe even try out one of their moisturizing body washes while you're at it. Now, y'all, I use the unscented native, and it replaced the one I've been using my entire adult life. And I sweat. I go work out with it, whatever. It covers me. There's no bad smell, and I love putting healthy stuff on my body. So smell fresh all day long with Native. Get 20% off your first order by going to nativedeo.com slash R-L-R-C or use promo code R-L-R-C at checkout. That's Native D eo.com slash rlrc or use promo code rlrc at checkout for 20 percent off your first order he pulls out and he hauls tail up to the gas station he pulls in he sees the white corolla over to the side and he goes in to the store and there's a couple witnesses in the store that are there and i'll get to them in a minute but he sees a guy laying down on the floor who's been shot in the back. And y'all, that was Murray Broussard, okay? And he said you could see, obviously, he had been shot. I mean, he had blood all over him, but, uh, but it, the, he was laying face down, and, and Billy said, hey, you know, I'm Deputy Amy. And he was like, man, don't worry about me. He said, my friend's in the car. He's dead. He's dead. He's been shot. He's been, he's been shot in the head. And medical and all had been uh, in route, y'all. Billy goes outside, and the... I'll come back and read the report to you in a few minutes. I'm going off of memory. But Billy goes outside and approaches the Corolla, and he can see a large hole in the rear window, and he walks up to the passenger side. And the passenger side window is down about, I'm guessing about maybe a foot, partially rolled down. And he said, Woody, I looked in. And I saw a white male in the seat. And he said his head was blown off. He said, actually, he said his head was still smoking. And y'all, I have the, the photographs, et cetera, and I'll never share them, but I've seen them. And there's no doubt when you look at Shane's, it turned out to be Shane Bear. when you looked at his head that it was, there was no way humanly possible he could be alive. And we'll leave it at that. And so he, Billy said he, he backs out at that time Perry Rushing, I think his unit number used to be like LP-307, uh, had arrived on scene. Now, let me tell you about Perry. Perry was a very successful businessman, but he loved to do police work, and he did it strictly volunteer. He would come out in his uniform. He's very physically fit, always worked out, always ran a lot, but it, 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 he's older than me. You know, I mean, I don't know how old he is now, but back then I remember you know, him being like maybe – 15, 20 years older than me. 
And but he would always come out at nighttime on his on his own time. I even think that he paid for his own unit for the stuff on it and everything else. But he would come out and man, he would catch calls like he was the the freshest young rookie in the world. And he was always very professional. But you know, he would write some tickets and stuff like that. But when the calls got hot, Perry would come rolling, right? And you could always depend on Perry rushing to back you up. Now, when I left the sheriff's office, Perry was much much higher ranking and I don't know what what classification he is but um anyway so Perry lived up in Watson and he shows up on the scene and Billy tells him it's 10-7 10-7 in the car meaning deceased in the car so Perry you you would think a guy in his position and social standing and everything else would be above doing the grunt work not Perry rushing he immediately starts to rope off the gas station with crime scene tape um billy goes back inside and starts to take statements the and i'm gonna read these some of this to y'all let me back up for a second y'all the so when billy goes up to the car he sees the the hole in the rear window he walks around he sees the passenger side window partially down he sees that the white male is obviously deceased like i told you it was severe severe head trauma still and it's hard to hear from, for the family but the head was still smoking he walked around the other side of the car and he was able to see another large uh obviously a shotgun blast to the rear driver side window okay but the, he goes back in and i'm gonna just read you his report about what happened and i'll tell you about it so billy says he was dispatched to Live Oak Village. And y'all, that's the name of the place. I couldn't remember. He was dispatched to Live Oak Village due to a subject that had been shot in the head. Upon arrival, he found one Murray Broussard sitting at a table inside the Live Oak Village. As soon as I, henceforth Billy Amy, made contact with Mr. Broussard, Mr. Broussard advised me that his friend had been shot in the head and was in his white Toyota car where he then pointed with his hand out into the parking lot. I approached the white Toyota Corolla where I found one white male subject sitting in the passenger seat with his head back and a large hole through the right side of his head with a black powder residue on the right side of the face and the right side of the neck area. At 21.20, and y'all that's 9.20 p.m., I advise lpso communications that the subject i found in the car was dead i went back into the live oak village to talk to mr broussard while deputy perry Russian lp 307 was trying to secure the scene when i went back into live oak village i noticed that mr broussard had been shot in the back area mr broussard stated that he and, and mr abear y'all that's shane drove up into the Live Oak Park ball area where they approached a Honda Accord maroon in color four door with a bent hood with a rope connecting the hood to the front bumper. Mr. Broussard stated that the car belonged to Matt Street. Mr. Broussard stated that Matt Street and the subject by the first name of Avery, he didn't know the last name, were standing by the car. Mr. Broussard stated he then saw a shotgun and then shots were fired. Mr. Broussard stated that his friend was shot in the head while sitting in the car and Mr. Broussard stated that he was shot in the back area while trying to drive away. A bolo, that's what be on the lookout for y'all, was immediately put out on the Honda Accord and the two subjects that were given by Mr. Broussard Matt Street and Avery were located in the car. Matt, Mr. Broussard stated that he did not know who did the shooting with the shotgun. At 21.38 hours, that's 9.38 p.m., y'all, Mr. Glenn E. Carpenter Jr. identified the subject that was shot in the head inside the car as being Dennis Shane Abair. This was Mr. Carpenter's nephew. At approximately 22.38 hours, 10.38 p.m., y'all. Proto Record Service towed the victim's car, the 92 Toyota Corolla, license number 
Delta India Whiskey 719 to Live Oak Auto Center where it was stored at approximately 23.04 hours. That's 11.04, y'all. Mel's record service towed the possible suspect's car, the 89 Honda Accord, license number Foxtrot Oscar Golf 393 to Live Oak Auto Center where it was stored for further investigation. And then you have a couple witness statements of what happened, y'all, that Billy took from the witnesses that were in the store. And I want to read those to you. The first witness was Miss Carla. I mean, you know, I'm not going to say her last name. We'll just call her Carla. And she writes, about 9 o'clock and 9.05, Murray Broussard came into the store and told me to call 911. Murray said he and Shane had been shot. Murray said Shane had been shot in the head and he was dead. I called 911 right after Murray told me what happened. Murray said he knew who'd done it. Murray kept saying he is dead. After I got off the phone with 911, I went to check on Murray. Later, Murray told me Matt and Avery and one other guy shot them at the ballpark. And she said that Murray had a dark spot on the, on the right side of the back near his spine, which which looked like a hole. Hey, y'all. You know what? I One of the things I hate the most is shopping online because you never know what you're going to get, if it's going to fit, you know, is the size and accurate, especially on the shoes or, or is they comfy as they look like my running shoes and, or tennis shoes that I, I like to wear you know we have to break them in is there a restocking fee for returns well let me tell you about Rothy's that's R-O-T-H-Y-S Rothy's takes the guesswork out of shoe shopping with comfort right out of the box and super easy and free returns and exchanges from the unbeatable comfort to the fact that you can wash them what more evidence do you need than Rothy's shoes? Check every box. Y'all, my favorite, the ones I have, are the RS01 tennis shoes. I love them. They fit right. I can wash them. They're super easy to clean. And uh, it's not unlike any pair of tennis shoes I've ever owned. But the point and the flat from Rothy's may be the usual suspects that you've heard of. But they also make insanely comfortable sneakers, loafers, ankle boots, and more. The best part is everything Rothy's makes is better for the planet. They've repurposed millions of water bottles into their signature thread that goes into every single one of their products. The RS01, again, my favorite. I've, I've washed them numerous times. They're comfortable. They're unique. They don't look like the tennis shoes I normally wear, which are running shoes. And they they last forever, y'all. Every time you wash them, it's like they're brand new. So, but... They do men's and women's and different apparel things. Go check them out. That's Rothy's, R-O-T-H-Y-S. Solve the case of your next favorite spring shoe with Rothy's, plus get $20 off your first purchase at rothys.com slash R-L-R-C. That's $20 off at R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash R-L-R-C. Check them out. So then we have a statement, the second statement Billy took from a lady named Miss Loretta, and we'll leave it at that. Miss Loretta says, after I got off at work at the pizza place, I went to the store for gas, and while I was in there talking to Carla, a man came in, and it was around 9.05 because I clocked out at 8.50 p.m. Carla called him Murray. He was crying and had blood all over his clothes, and there were chunks of what I assume human flesh on his right side of his shirt. He kept saying that his friend had just got his head blown off, and he wanted Carla to call the cops. So she did. He said his friend was in the car. I looked out and saw a white car with the flashes on parked crooked by the barbecue pit. Carla was talking to 911 and Murray at the same time. Carla kept telling him to lie down, but he wouldn't. He said a man named Avery and a man named Matt 
shot his friend named Shane. He wanted to know if he was shot and took off his shirt. And he had a dark spot on the right side of his spine, which looked like a hole. And I told Carla I was going to stay with her and went to the back phone and called Mr. Perry Russian and explained the best I could. Murray was on a cell phone when I came back up front. Murray was telling someone about him and his friend. Mr. Billy Amy came up to the store and I met him outside, pointed him in the direction of the car and went back inside. About five minutes later, everyone showed up. A girl came into the store screaming at Murray that all this was over drugs. Murray didn't answer yes or no. He was just crying. The paramedics came in and took Murray out, and the store remained a wreck. The paramedics' statements are pretty much just similar, but I'll read them to you real quick. One is by Todd. I'm not going to say his last name. And he says, at 9.15 p.m. tonight, I was dispatched to a medical emergency at Live Oak Village. I arrived on the scene about 9.18 and proceeded inside to assess the situation. Mike and Perry Rushing were already on the scene, and I asked Mike what happened. Mike informed me that we had one apparent 10-7. That's a dead person, y'all. And one patient with a gunshot wound to the back. During the patient assessment, I discovered what appeared to be shotgun pellet embedded in the outer layer of the clothes of the patient. There didn't appear to be any actual entrance, so the wound was dressed and oxygen was administered. And basically, y'all, when the ambulance got to the scene and began their assessment, I removed the pellet from the outer sweatshirt and gave it to the paramedic who took custody of it in case it was needed at the hospital. Later, when questioned by LP detectives, I informed him of the facts and he requested a statement of the events. And y'all, the other one is just another one uh, of, about the paramedic that comes in and addresses Murray Bruce Hart's wounds. Now, let's talk about this, okay? The, what do you do then? Naturally, you're gonna call the detectives and, and everything else, but word spreads fast, okay? And Shane's mama said she was sitting in her residence and sitting in her chair and she had her back sliding door facing her and she said the door slung open and her mama, Shane's grandmother, and Shane's wife came in and said, Shane's been shot, Shane's been shot. And she's like, no, no. And they were like, yes. And, and she said she got dressed and they loaded up and they go to Live Oak Village. By the time they got there, everybody was there, right? And the detectives on the scene and, and all the cops and even the sheriff, Willie Graves, was there. And she was like, just let me get to the car. Let me get to the car. I can help him. And they were like, no, you can't. And she said it got to the point where she kept trying. And the deputy told her, said, listen. You do not want to see. She said they never told him that he was dead. She said that said you do not want to see him like this. And if I have to, I'll put you in handcuffs and put you in the back of the car. You've got to stay out. This is a crime scene. And um, she, she told me, the mama told me that when Willie was there, Sheriff Graves was there. She went up to him and was like, "Please, you know, Willie, tell me he's going to be okay. Tell me he's going to be okay." And she knew Willie, uh, Sheriff Graves, and he said, I'm sorry, sweetie, he's not, he's gone. And it was sometime after that that uh, her brother actually identified him, um, what was left of Shane, and she told me that to this day, that's the worst thing he's ever seen in his life. And y'all, it's true. It's that bad, okay? But in processing the vehicle and there's obviously three shots that were fired. You have, and I will release the pictures of the of the hole in the back glass uh, from a shot, and the hole in the rear driver side door. Obvious, another shotgun blast. It's not like it came through the back window and went out this one. You can see where the glass was going in. So the shot that killed Shane. Remember, that I told you the window was partially down 
came through that window. Now, let's back up to the ballpark. What Billy had told me about there being a third vehicle. Um, later on, the mom said that Murray told them that Avery had come up and was talking to him through his window and um, happened to look out. Now, Shane's sitting to his right. He happens to look to his right as he sees a shotgun coming in the window and the first shot goes off. <laughs> Immediately killing Shane in the most horrible way possible, right? Murray panics, hits the gas, goes to haul ass, and then there's another shot. <laughs> And then another shot. And one of those two shots, I believe it's probably the one through the rear window, um, Murray was shot in the back. Fortune favors the bold, the strong, the brave. For your business to break out of anything holding you back, you need business checking as brave as you are. Introducing Novo Business Checking. Novo is powerfully simple business checking. And unlike the traditional banking model, Novo has no minimum balances, no transaction limits, and no hidden fees. Instead of a one-size-fits-all approach, Novo is customized to your business to save you time and free up cash flow with seamless integrations to Stripe, Shopify, QuickBooks, Online, and more. Sign up for Novo for free and join the community of over 150,000 fearless small businesses who have found the customizable business checking solution that admires their brave. Sign up for free business checking account right now at novo.co slash RLRC. Plus, Real Life Real Crime listeners get access to over $5,000 in perks and discounts. Go to novo.co slash RLRC to sign up for free. Novo.co slash RLRC. Novo Platform Inc. is a fintech, not a bank. Banking services provided by Middlesex Federal Savings FA member FDIC terms and conditions apply. Now, Murray went up there on the pretense of selling a pound of marijuana to Adam Carrier. All right, and that he just happened to see Shane at the store asked Shane to ride with him. Shane's like, okay, all right, I'll do it, right? I mean, when you're that young, you don't think sugar could turn to shit. And so he goes with his friend. They pull up. Avery approaches, is talking to Murray, and I submit to you that this is my opinion that Kerry had no intentions of letting anybody leave there. That it was going to be a robbery. And it was a robbery gone wrong, obviously. But I don't, you know, when you put the shotgun in the window and you shoot Shane that close, when that, you know, I could say that close because you can see the tattooing and the stuff, and not only the force of the damage to Shane's head, but you can see the, what we call tattooing, which means it's almost a contact wound. When you, when you shoot around out of a firearm, whether it's a pistol or shotgun or whatever, you shoot uh, the gunpowder that actually pushes the, the round out, or in this case, the pellets out. Uh, if, it, if it's close enough, it will, it will, stick in your skin and turn it black it tattoos you literally you can't ever get it out it would go underneath your skin so that proves my point of it being I mean, sneak attack shotgun through the window and didn't get both of them dead as Bruce R is trying to haul ass rear window 
driver's rear window. And that's when they pulled out on the highway. Murray pulled out on the highway in front of Billy Amy. And I wonder if that call hadn't come in, that 62 panic alarm, Billy was going back. Think about that. He'd have been there. He'd have seen the gun flashes. He'd have heard the shots at least. But that's how God works. Later that evening, like hours later, and we'll get into it next week, how this came about, how Carrier was a suspect. Carrier wasn't arrested in, in the maroon car with the other two, the, with uh, Matthew Street and Avery. But detectives went and found Adam Carrier asleep in his bed and arrested him. Adam Carrier's father at the time was a school board member, a Livingston Parish school board member, and he had some other relatives that were high up. I'm not saying it one way or another, but they went and arrested him there, and all three were booked into the Livingston Parish jail on first-degree murder for Shane and one of one count of attempted first degree murder for Murray. And I'll read you the original news article and then I'm gonna shut it down for this week. And y'all remember this story is an urban legend for a reason. And if you know about it, fine, but you're not gonna know everything I'm gonna share with you next week. And then I, I hope we can include it next week, but if not, I have something really special. But I'll read this to you. Three booked and slain. Livingston. Sheriff deputies booked three men with first-degree murder Tuesday after the three allegedly shot and killed a Denham Springs teenager in an attempted drug deal. One of these arrested, Adam Carrier, 19, of 9673 Florida Boulevard Walker, is a son of Livingston Parish School Board member Ernest Carrier, Jr., Deputies also booked Matthew J. Street, 18, of 328 Robbie Drive, and Avery Lejeune, 21, of 8843 Hess Lane, both Denham Springs, on one count of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. The men are accused of shooting Dennis Shane Abair in the head with a shotgun at point-blank range, as he sat in a car at the Live Oaks Sports Association ballpark, Livingston Parish Sheriff Willie Graves said, A Bear's companion, Murray Broussard, no age available, of Jones Creek Village Avenue, Baton Rouge, who was in the driver's seat, received minor wounds, but was able to escape serious injury by driving away from the scene as two more shotgun blasts shattered the windows of his car, Graves said. The victims met the three men in the deserted parking lot of the baseball field to conduct a drug deal Monday night, the sheriff said. Deputies said Carrier, Lejeune, and Broussard named Street as the trigger man, saying he indicated he was going to rob, shoot the victims, but they thought he was joking. Street alleged that Lejeune fired the shot that killed Bear. authorities said. Deputy searched Tuesday for the weapon used in the slain and another shotgun, which the three men allegedly discarded after the shooting. Bear is the second teenager slain with a shotgun in Livingston Parish in two days. And it goes on to tell about the other one, the uh, case that I told you that Shane and his mama had talked about the day before. He was brutally murdered. Now, y'all, this story has lots of twists and turns, and I'm going to continue it next week, The what happened after the rest and into the trial, etc. But whether they knew Shane was going to be in the car, which I don't think they did. Shane didn't know he was going to be into the car until a few minutes you know, earlier when he saw Murray at the store. But that window being cracked, and I can't show you 
that side of it, but I will Patreon convicts. I'll send y'all the um the other shots in the car and and the police reports and all that. But of course, I wasn't there, and I don't have any direct knowledge. But from the old homicide part of me, you don't walk up on a car. You're talking to one guy. You're supposed to be doing a, a deal for a pound of weed. Um, but those three that were there, at least one of them had said, hey, I'm going to rob him. I'm going to rob him for his dope and his money. And you walk up. That window happens to be down. You walk up where they can't see you. You put the shotgun in the window and you start shooting. And whether or not you knew Shane was sitting in the passenger seat, you killed him. That's murder. Period. Cars speeding away. And you, it, I'm not saying that two people didn't shoot from the different angles of the bullets but or, or the shotgun blast. But the car speeding away and you're still shooting two more times. You had no intention of anybody ever leaving that scene over a proposed pound of weed and whatever money this boy might be carrying. And I'm going to conclude this episode of I Did It. Tune in next week. We'll pick it up again. You really need to hear it. And I'm Woody Overton, your host of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. Now, for some Real Life, Real Crime announcements. By the time y'all heard this or hear this, um, I will have been the Grand Marshal for the Crew of Denham Springs Parade. And I want to give a big shout out to the Crew of Denham Springs uh, Parade for giving me that honor. Such an honor to be your Grand Marshal. And I hope I rocked it. Um, and also, we're having a real life, real crime and friends float that should be in front of me in the parade. I hope y'all enjoyed that and caught some good throws. Throw me something, Mr. Right? That it, when you get this, it should be Mardi Gras Day, actually. The regular people in the Patreon and, and convicts, you'll get it early. But the so thank you so much, Crew Denim. Love you. Uh, it was awesome. Chase Tyler, the world famous Chase Tyler band, is actually driving me in the parade. And uh, my good friend Billy Amy is going to ride with me. I'm filming myself right now on video, and you'll be able to see it on YouTube. You have to search real life real crime podcast not just real life real crime real life real crime podcast if you like it we're doing videos on every one of my episodes now or you want to just see me tell the story go check it out hit subscribe you'll get notified anytime we release anything on there also i'm on instagram at real life real crime or at Overton Woody. And I post different stuff on there every day. And don't forget about our Real Life Real Crime community app. Download it for free from the App Store. I'm going there every day first and answering questions, etc. before I even go to the crew page, which now has over 37,200 something members itself. But the Real Life Real Crime community app has everything Real Life Real Crime uncensored. Go check it out. It's free. There's just so much more than you can get if you combine all my social media pages together. The app has that times infinity. So, um, just want to thank y'all. Love and appreciate each and every one of you. And I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but it is what it is. The LOPA, Louisiana Organ Procurement Agency, if you are be a hero, give the gift of life. It does, you don't have to be from Louisiana to sign up to be an organ donor. Go to lopa.org. or you could be from Bermuda and want to be an organ donor. Sign up for it. It takes like two minutes, and maybe one day you get to be a hero and give the gift of life or sight or whatever. So, and I'm Woody Everton, your host of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. And until next time or ever, don't let me catch you down on murder by you. Yeah, the right to remain silent. Any 
that you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney prior to or during any question. If you can't afford one, the court will appoint one for you. Do you understand your rights? And the wolf is at your door. 